Section 7 of A to Z. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. A to Z by Various. A biographical sketch of the Reverend Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, LLD, the first great educator of the deaf in America. Prepared on the occasion of the Gallaudet Centennial Commemoration, December 1887, by Henry Winter Sile, M.A. A saying as true as it is common declares, like father, like son. As physical peculiarities of stature and form, feature and color, descend from generation to generation, and afford means of easily recognizing relationship, so it is beyond question that intellectual and moral characteristics are likewise transmitted. The varying circumstances of each generation have more influence upon the development of the mind and the spirit than upon that of the body, in which latter the possible range of variation is far more limited. A great man may, like Washington, leave no son, or, like Cromwell, one of only ordinary abilities. Still it has been observed in enough cases to establish the law that strong natural abilities and a tendency to exert them in a certain direction are as genuine family traits as any physical feature. As the ages of brass and iron recede, and happy days roll onward, leading up the golden year, the world more readily perceives and more openly confesses its indebtedness to those great men whose capacity, stimulated by zeal and displayed in patient toil, has been exerted not amid the clash of arms or in the intrigues of statecraft, but in the gentle paths of peace. These now are honored, who least of all strove for honor. Glory of warrior, glory of orator, glory of song, paid with a voice flying by to be lost on an endless sea, glory of virtue, to fight, to struggle, to right the wrong. Nay, but she aimed not at glory, nor lover of glory she. Give her the glory of going on, and still to be. Many a father has there been, whose son trod in his footsteps, and both attained eminence. But few instances can be cited where a father and two sons, while devoting themselves to the same special kind of beneficence, to helping the same class of their fellow men, yet each struck out his own path. Each was the pioneer in a new field. Each accomplished results peculiarly his own, of far-reaching influence and worthy to be held in lasting remembrance. Few names can be ranked with that of Gallaudet. A hundred years have all but rolled by since he who first made this name illustrious saw the light, and preparations are now being made far and wide to commemorate his centennial birthday. On this occasion, pen and pencil here combine to offer a tribute to the memory of the Reverend Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, LLD, the man who more than any other gave to the deaf of America the blessing of education and to that of her who was the worthy wife of such a man, the mother of such sons as the Reverend Thomas Gallaudet, D.D., and Edward Minor Gallaudet, Ph.D., L.L.D., sons by whose work in the church and in the college, their fathers in the school has been fitly supplemented. Mention, too, is made of Alice Cogswell, through whom he was led into his beneficent career, and of her father, Dr. Mason F. Cogswell, to whose exertions the establishment of the Hartford Institution was originally due. The engraver's art depicts their features and those of some of Gallaudet's associates. Miss Huntley, better known as the poetess Mrs. Sigourney, Sickard and Clare, Weld, Bartlett, Turner, and others. Here also will be seen views of the scenes of their labors, the edifices they reared, these their true monuments, but supplemented by grateful affection with the sculptured shaft and animated bust, which preserve the name and lineaments of Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet and his friend and fellow laborer, Lorraine Clare. Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet was born in Philadelphia on the 10th of December, 1787. He came of a Huguenot family. His great-grandfather, Peter Elihu Gallaudet, a Protestant minister at Rochelle in France, came to this country about the time of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 and joined the Huguenot settlement at New Rochelle on Long Island Sound, a few miles from New York. He had a son, Thomas Gallaudet, whose name is stamped on a prayer book of the Church of England, now in the possession of his namesake in New York. 
the son of this Thomas, Peter W. Gallaudet, married Jane Hopkins, daughter of Captain Thomas Hopkins, a descendant of one of the first settlers of Hartford. And the family, which had come to Philadelphia, removed in 1800 to that city. His college classmate and biographer, the Reverend Heman Humphrey, D.D., says, He grew up a sprightly and promising boy. His correct deportment, his amiable temper, his sparkling eye, and his studious habits gave early promise of the high distinction which awaited him in classical attainments, and in the improvement of those native talents which prepared him for such eminent usefulness in after life. Among his papers was found a reverie, written in his boyhood, upon the various causes which had contributed to break the golden chain which once bound together the whole family of man. Towards its end is found the following remarkable anticipation of the language of signs, by the use of which so much of his usefulness was achieved. Before the millennium arrives, will one language prevail and swallow up the rest, or will mankind agree to form a universal language? What shall this universal language be? Is there already one provided by nature herself, easy of acquisition, universal in its application, and which demands neither types nor paper? Young Gallaudet graduated from Yale College in 1805 with the highest honors, though the youngest among such classmates as the Reverend Doctors Samuel F. Harvis, Heman Humphrey, Gardiner Spring, and John M. Witten. He then studied law for a year, but his health failing, after another year of literary study, he spent two more as a tutor at Yale, and then entered a mercantile house. At this point of his life, his thoughts were strongly directed to spiritual affairs. He made a public profession of faith in Christ, united with the Congregational Church, and devoted himself to the sacred ministry. Completing the theological course at Andover in 1814, he was invited to the pastorate of several parishes. But God was calling him into a field as yet untilled, and to labors truly missionary in character, though performed at home. How singularly was his course of life, which had perhaps seemed fragmentary and unsatisfactory, ordered as a preparation for the duties now to be discharged. His natural abilities, his academical, legal, and theological acquirements, and his experience in teaching, would all find use in the task of introducing and developing a system of education of the deaf, for whom there was as yet not one school in America. We do not intend here to review the history of deaf-mute education up to that time. It was briefly sketched in our Retrospect of the Education of the Deaf, Philadelphia, 1886. Suffice it to say that from time to time during centuries attempts were made by all sorts of methods and more or less successfully with a few favored individuals. The most distinguished Englishman who made the experiment was the Reverend Dr. John Wallace, a professor at Oxford. The system by which he taught several children, beginning in 1661, was described in some letters, mainly in the transactions of the Royal Society. Finally, the private schools, kept by one person and receiving the rich only, developed into public institutions for the masses of the people, sustained by government or by benevolent contributions. On the continent of Europe, such institutions became quite numerous, most of them springing from the schools begun by Heineke in Germany and de Lepe in France, both about the year 1760. Nearly at the same time, Thomas Braidwood, a teacher of elocution at Edinburgh, began teaching deaf children. He was largely indebted to Wallace's publications. His school attracted great attention from the most learned men, such as Dr. Samuel Johnson, and drew pupils even from America. In 1783, he removed to Hackney, a suburb of London. The banker-poet Rogers, in his Table Talk, mentions meeting at a dinner party at Hackney Charles James Fox, with whom was his son, a dumb boy who was the very image of his father, having come for the occasion from Braidwood's Academy. To him, Fox almost entirely confined his attention, conversing with him by the fingers, and their eyes glistened as they looked at each other. Talleyrand remarked to me, How strange it was to dine in company with the first orator in Europe, and only see him talk with his fingers. The accounts preserved of Braidwood's pupils show that he was a skillful and successful teacher. 
that his art was gainful appears from one lady's spending seven thousand five hundred dollars to have her son under him ten years this lady's compassion for the mothers unable to meet such a heavy expense enlisted her friends in the establishment of the london institution in seventeen ninety two braidwood's nephew joseph watson obtained the headmastership and handed it down to his son and grandson the last of whom resigned in eighteen seventy eight similarly the schools projected elsewhere had to come for their heads to the family which alone possessed this art small wonder that the family strove to keep so profitable a secret to themselves one grandson thomas braidwood went to birmingham in eighteen fourteen another john to edinburgh in 1810 but in a couple of years went to virginia as private tutor to the second generation of deaf children in the balling family his successor was robert kinneborough formerly an assistant at hackney who was put under bonds of five thousand dollars not to impart the method of instruction to any other teacher for seven years and allowed to receive private pupils only on condition of paying half their fees to the braidwoods in 1816 just after Gallaudet's repulse, the existing schools unanimously refused to aid one projected at Dublin, and when at last Kinneborough was free from his bonds, he would give three months' training to its intended teacher, only on payment of $750. In America, meantime, the deaf were not unnoticed, nor the possibility of their education unknown, though traces of them are few. The Pennsylvania Magazine of February, 1776, a copy of which was lately presented to the institution at Philadelphia, gave a cut of a two-hand alphabet, which differs somewhat from that now known as the British. The accompanying article, though hinting at its possible convenience for the deaf, spoke of it mainly as a means of amusement for the hearing, just as de Lepe alluded to the smallest schoolboys, in his early days, talking with both hands from one end of the class to the other. The first American educated deaf mutes we hear of were Thomas Balling of Goochland County, Virginia, sent to Edinburgh in 1771, and his sister Mary, who followed five years later. The next was Charles, son of Francis Green of Boston. His father had in his youth been an officer in the British Army, and at the Revolution his sympathies led him to make his home in England. The boy, who had at an early age proved to be a deaf mute, was placed in Braidwood School in February 1780, being then eight years old. Mr. Green took the most affectionate interest in his progress, and in 1783, to help Braidwood, published a book named Vox Oculus Subjecta, written in English, despite its Latin name, which gives highly interesting accounts of Braidwood's success, and extracts from earlier writers on the education of the deaf, carefully omitting, however, to describe the methods employed. But nearly thirty years elapsed before the steps were taken which led to the establishment of the first school for the deaf in America. In the city of Hartford there dwelt one of the most distinguished surgeons of America, Dr. Mason Fitch Cogswell. Sprung from an old New England family, born in 1761, he rapidly rose to professional eminence, thanks to a mind never ruffled or disconcerted, a hand that never trembled, and a happy dexterity in the use of instruments. Nor were his social qualities less admirable. Professor Jonathan Knight, who gives the above estimate of him, adds, No man I have ever known enjoyed more entirely the confidence, esteem, and respect of all with whom he was in any way associated. He was, as all who knew agree, a kind, benevolent, and noble-spirited man. In the domestic circle, and in the society of his friends, he was polite, cheerful, and abounding in pleasant and instructive conversation. He was an assiduous and successful cultivator of polite literature, especially of poetry, and a proficient in music, and the active friend and supporter of every plan for the relief of the misfortunes and distress of his fellow men. To him, among other children, there was born on August 31st, 1805, a lovely daughter named Alice. Hardly had she completed her second year when a severe illness destroyed her hearing, and her speech faded away and was almost entirely lost before she was four years old. Her disposition was sweet, and her mind responded readily to such efforts as could be made for its development. 
Still, her progress was painfully behind that of her hearing playmates of her own age. Among these were the younger children of the Gallaudet family, her next-door neighbors. And one day, as the child, now about eight years old, was playing in their garden, she met their elder brother Thomas, then a theological student. Catching with native quickness and impressiveness her instinctive gesture talk, he skillfully managed to make her understand that the few and simple characters of the word hat represented the article he held in his hand. Following up this beginning, he succeeded in teaching her many words and even sentences, and when his own studies called him away, the work was continued by her own family and other friends, aided by one of Sicard's books, which Dr. Cogswell procured from Paris. Alice was enabled to attend with her sisters the private school of the accomplished and amiable Miss Lydia Huntley, better known as Mrs. Sigourney. This gifted lady gives in her autobiography, Letters of Life, the following interesting account. On Friday afternoon was a thorough review of all the studies which had been pursued during the week. Then also my dear little silent disciple Alice Cogswell, the loved of all, had her pleasant privilege of examination. Coming ever to my side if she saw me a moment disengaged, with her sweet supplication, Please teach Alice something. The words or historical facts thus explained by signs were alphabetically arranged in a small manuscript book for her to recapitulate and familiarize. Great was her delight when called forth to take her part. Descriptions and animated gestures she was fond of intermingling with a few articulate sounds. Fragments from the annals of all nations, with the signification of a multitude of words, had been taught by little and little, until her lexicon had become comprehensive and as her companions, from love, had possessed themselves of the manual alphabet and much of the sign language, they affectionately proposed that the examination should be of themselves, and that she might be permitted to conduct it. Here was a new pleasure, the result of their thoughtful kindness. Eminently happy was she made, while each in rotation answered with the lips her question given by the hand. I, alternately officiating as interpreter to her, or critic to them, if an explanation chanced to be erroneous. Never can I forget the varied expression of intelligence, naivety, irony, or love that would irradiate from her beautiful hazel eyes on these occasions. It was such intercourse that suggested the following poetical reply to a question once asked in the institution of the Abbe Sicard at Paris. La seule se trouve-t-il malheureux? Are the deaf and dumb unhappy? Oh, could the kind inquirer gaze upon thy brow with gladness fraught, its smile like inspiration's rays would give the answer to his thought. Thine active life, thy look of bliss, the sparkling of thy magic eye, would all his skeptic doubts dismiss and bid him lay his pity by. For sure the stream of voiceless course may flow as deep, as pure, as blessed, as that which bursts in torrents hoarse, or whitens o'er the mountain's breast. The only known portrait of Alice Cogswell is a large silhouette, which, however, preserves her sweet expression. For the privilege of reproducing it, and two oil paintings of Dr. Cogswell at the age of about thirty and sixty years, respectively, we are indebted to his descendants, Mrs. William H. Hodge of Philadelphia, and Dr. L. Van Rensselaer, of Burlington, New Jersey. Dr. Cogswell's inquiries discovered no less than 84 deaf persons in Connecticut, and his representations had such influence that at a meeting held at his house on April 13, 1815, it was resolved to send a suitable person to Europe to learn the art of instructing the deaf, and returning, open a school. Mr. Gallaudet was universally regarded as the man for the mission, and in a few weeks he set sail. Four months were spent in learning that the doors of the British schools were barred with gold and opened but to golden keys. The committees, however willing, found to their mortification and regret that the secret was securely held by the Braidwood family. But on his arrival in London, Mr. Gallaudet had met the Abbe Sicard, the ingenious successor of the benevolent de Lepe at Paris, who was exhibiting his pupils Massieu and Claire. 
and received a polite invitation to visit his famous school. Its methods had been declared by the venerated philosopher, Dugald Stewart, superior to those of Braidwood, as being of a higher nature and capable of more extensive usefulness. Mr. Gallaudet therefore proceeded to Paris, after spending the winter in study at Edinburgh, where Stewart's young and eloquent successor in the chair of moral philosophy, Dr. Thomas Brown, studied with him the letters of Alice Cogswell, and one day declared, "'If I were not engaged in my duties at the university, I know of no pursuit in which I could take more delight than in the instruction of the deaf and dumb.'" At Paris, he enjoyed every facility for learning the methods used, from the lowest class to the highest, and received special lessons, if not from Sicard himself, which is doubtful, certainly from Claire, Massieu, and Palmier. He had already grasped, from Sicard's books, the theory of the system. To put it into practice in America, he perceived the desirability of taking home with him as his right-hand man, someone who had by long experience acquired a thorough familiarity with details, and could at leisure impart them to himself and future assistants and who was himself deaf, and thus an exponent of its success. Such a man he found in Laurent Clare, and with this coadjutor he landed in New York on August 9, 1816, after an absence of fifteen months. Meantime, Dr. Cogswell and other friends had procured subscriptions and a charter for the Connecticut Asylum. The next eight months were devoted to preparations for its opening, which included journeys as far as Boston, Albany, and Philadelphia. The first three pupils are said to have been Alice Cogswell, George H. Loring, and Wilson Witten. With these and four others, the school was opened on Wednesday, April 15, 1817. The house number 15, now 48, Prospect Street, was occupied for all purposes except meals, which were taken at the city hotel the little family marching to and fro, as Dr. W. W. Turner a few years ago graphically told Mr. Cullingworth. The view we give is believed to be the first ever published, and is from a photograph taken expressly for this work. At the door, our artist has imagined Gallaudet and Claire standing with their first three pupils. Thus began thirteen years of arduous toils in the maintenance and management of the establishment. Its rapid growth necessitated the erection of a building, which was dedicated May 2, 1821, and has since been much enlarged. A grant of land, the proceeds of which formed a liberal endowment, was made by Congress in 1819 and 20. In some degree, through the interest aroused during a visit to Washington by Mr. Clare, who was received with distinguished courtesy, and the name of the school was in consequence changed to the American Asylum. It was at first thought this one school would suffice for the whole country, but others sprang up almost immediately and carried off, temporarily or permanently, some of the best of the teachers whom Mr. Gallaudet, with Mr. Clare's valuable help, carefully trained. Clare himself was spared for six months to set on a firm footing the Pennsylvania institution, and on his return, Louis Weld, a son-in-law of Dr. Cogswell, went there till recalled to succeed Gallaudet. Harvey P. Peet's administrative ability and David E. Bartlett's warm heart, magnetic energy, and dramatic power were given to New York. John A. Jacobs came from Kentucky to enjoy a year's training preparatory to establishing the first school west of the Alleghenies. William W. Turner remained steadfastly at Hartford through a long career as teacher, steward, and principal. His recent death at the age of 87 leaves Samuel Porter, dean of the faculty of the college at Washington, who began teaching soon after Gallaudet's retirement, the nester of the profession. Unfortunately, Mr. Gallaudet was compelled to the last, even when presiding over eight instructors and 140 pupils, himself to teach a class. And worn out by toil, in 1830 his failing health forced him to resign but he continued ever helpful and honored as the father of the deaf. The pupils received in those early days were, as a class, far harder to control and teach than the children who now fill our schoolrooms. 
many of them were men and women grown. Out of the 31 admitted in 1817, 15 were over 19 years of age, one being 40. 18 were born deaf, and 9 lost their hearing under 4 years of age. Such persons had formed habits difficult to alter, and had often been weakly indulged, so that to reduce them to discipline was a task demanding all Mr. Gallaudet's tact and authority. An anecdote, communicated by Dr. Thomas Gallaudet, shows his presence of mind. He was standing by the dining table, waiting to say grace, when in darted an unruly boy, who snatched up a knife and rushed at him. There was no escape, and with his delicate frame no chance in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict. Throwing open his dress, he bared his bosom and bade the boy strike. Abashed, he threw the weapon down. These facts throw light at once upon the severity of his labors, and upon his choice of means, his high estimate of the use of signs in preference to attempting to teach written language without their aid, and to spending time on articulation. Experience only confirmed him in this view, which he ably defended long after he retired from active teaching, in opposition to those who, with Horace Mann, would have banished signs on the plea of their hindering the mastery of English. He was of a deeply religious nature, and regarded it as of the highest importance to secure moral influence and spiritual development at the earliest possible day. This, he believed, could most speedily and effectually be done through signs. He is claimed to have been the first to use public prayer in signs with the assembled school. Although below the medium height and slightly built, he was a perfect master as well as an enthusiastic student of the language of gesture, as some interesting anecdotes remain to prove. With a bright pupil he would fold his arms and relate even a long narrative solely by the motion of his head and the play of his mobile and expressive features. He ascertained from an uneducated deaf-mute, eighty years old, his last wishes respecting his property, and subdued by simple and solemn prayer, a stubborn youth. Most pathetic of all, he stood by the bedside of Alice Cogswell in her heartbroken delirium after her father's death, fixed her wandering eye by the sacred sign of the wounded hand, and calmed and soothed that poor stricken lamb as he commended her to the good shepherd, so that when she shortly after closed her eyes, her end was peace. After leaving the institution, Dr. Gallaudet occupied himself largely in writing. He preached occasionally, but his only collected sermons are The Discourses, published in 1818. His other publications were Addresses and Reports in Behalf of the Deaf and of Various Benevolent Enterprises, Magazine Articles on the Principles and Practice of Education, and books for children, on religious subjects or to aid in the study of the English language. The Youth's Book on Natural Theology and some of the Scripture Biographies were translated into Russian, and the Child's Book on the Soul into French, German, Modern Greek, Chinese, Siamese, and other languages. The Hartford School for the Deaf is said to have been, with the exception of a small hospital for the insane in Virginia, the first institution for a special class in this country. Its success, in the face of great difficulty and discouragement, may, as his son President E. M. Gallaudet declares, be said to have afforded the inspiration for all systematic philanthropic effort in America. Many enterprises grew out of his own work, or were due to his suggestion, or indebted to his advocacy, and the list of schools colleges and societies which strove to secure his services is long and most remarkable. But he refused all invitations that would have taken him away from Hartford or interfered much with the use of his pen. For seven years he was the unpaid chaplain of the county jail, and in June, 1838, after having long urged provision for the spiritual care of the insane, he became the first chaplain to this class at the retreat in Hartford a charge he retained for the rest of his life. The decision to abide in Hartford was due largely to regard for the education of his children and for the happiness of his wife, whose own deafness only made him the more tender of her. Here she had, as he told an urgent friend, a place of worship on the Sabbath and a circle of intimate acquaintances who knew her language, 
and they were very near her aged mother and deaf and dumb sister, the latter ten years older than herself. Mrs. Gallaudet deserves more than a passing notice, but our limits are narrow. The reader will be well repaid by turning to the appreciative sketch from Professor Draper's graceful pen in the Annals for July, 1877. Fifteenth on the roll of admissions at Hartford stands the name of Sophia Fowler, of Guilford, Connecticut. From the day of her birth, March 20th, 1798, her ears were untouched by earth's broken harmonies. Pleasing in face and form and manner, and enjoying superb health, she grew up admirable in the relations of life and expert in household arts. But her eager mind had to wait nineteen years for the blessed opportunity of satisfying its highest cravings. During the next four years, much as she learned, her teacher learned more, to her unfeigned amazement, when at last he avowed his love. But his wooing was brief, and on August 29, 1821, their wedding set the seal to his conviction that deafness was no barrier to elevation to the social station of the most fortunate. Fortunate indeed was she, in the love and pride with which he ever regarded her. And as for him, for thirty years he found in her affection and her wisdom repose from weariness and relief from care. Seldom, says Henry Bernard, has domestic life been blessed with so sweet an accord of temper, taste, and views of family instruction and discipline, and by such a bright dower of clustering charities. And when that loved home was gradually broken up by death, and by the departure to other homes of the children, in whose guidance and the ways of happiness they both found delight, and who now arise up and call them blessed, she accompanied her youngest son Edward to the two humble cottages, which in 1857 formed the Columbia Institution, and remained its matron till 1866, by which time it had expanded into the college of which he was inaugurated president. At Hartford, and at Washington alike, the instance she presented of womanly sweetness, grace, and dignity, and faithful performance of all domestic and social duties, was as effective as her direct efforts, in impressing upon those whose favorable opinion was all-important, the value of that education which could produce such fruit. Her husband's deep and childlike piety was her own, and when at the ripe age of fourscore the summons came to join him, it fitly found her on her knees at her evening devotions. The morning of the next day, May 13th, 1877, bore her pure spirit to rejoin his own. We can only briefly record the two chief occasions on which the deaf people of America attested their veneration for Dr. Gallaudet. First, on September 26th, 1850, at the suggestion of Mr. Thomas Brown of New Hampshire, they presented to Dr. Gallaudet a silver pitcher and salver, suitably inscribed, and valued at three hundred dollars, and the like to Mr. Clare. Upon one side of each pitcher is an engraved scene, representing Mr. Gallaudet leaving France with Mr. Clare. The ship is at hand, and beyond the waves is seen the future institution. On the other side is an interior view of a schoolroom with teachers and pupils, and in front is the head of Sicard, while round the neck of the pitcher are the coats of arms of the New England States. Within a year, on September 10, 1851, after a long season of failing health, he said, I will go to sleep, and so gently breathed his last that the faithful daughter by his bedside knew it not. His memory lives in every heart, his monument is everywhere, in the persons of all who have been benefited by and through his labors. But the erection of some visible memorial was desired by those whom he educated. Accordingly, on September 6th, 1854, there was dedicated in front of the institution where he labored a graceful marble monument, noteworthy in that both the designs and the cost were contributed by the deaf. The general plan was by Albert Newsom, but the bas-relief was designed by John Carlin, who also delivered the oration at the dedication. It is only necessary to note that the word on the shaft, encircled by rays, is ephatha in Hebrew characters. 
The bas-relief is an admirable representation of Dr. Gallaudet with his three first pupils, one of whom he teaches as she stands at his knee. This conception, we understand, is to be embodied also in the bronze statue by D. C. French, to be erected in 1818, by contributions from the deaf and their friends throughout the land, on the grounds of the college at Washington. In the college, his work of intellectual elevation of the deaf has reached a higher point in the hands of his youngest son, as it was given to the eldest to take up and extend in the mission of the church his labors for their souls. End of section 7